okay um okay let's get started um so i'll i'll first just cover a couple of logistical details i mean uh, there's nothing new except um Just wanted to let you know that uh, this, I guess, week is uh, no submission week. So hopefully it was a little bit of a breather. Yeah, you have something? Oh, interesting. Oh. Yeah, it should come up in a second. Um, but uh, yeah, so we are here. Several lectures have gone by. And I hope you've kind of seen the steady state of these lectures, mostly introducing a new model, mostly focusing on a forward pass. Although, I mean, which basically means how your forward function would look like in a in a, in a uh, model definition, right? Uh, where you know, like, um, in, in, at least in PyTorch where you have an init function where you initialize your layers and then in a forward function, you define what's going on. And that's what we've been doing effectively. You know, if we think in terms of core terms, uh, with LSTMs, with transformer, with you know models before that, it was just a definition of how each statement in your power function would have looked like. Um, but we'll kind of continue that today as as well a little bit. Uh, but before getting into what we're going to cover today, um, next week is the deadline for having an intermediate report for your project uploaded on Blackboard. So the link is on Blackboard. Um, any questions about this before I discuss what you know? I'm I'm seeing if if there's any questions before I kind of say what what you should probably do or give some hints. Follow the project. Yeah. What is the intermediate report? Um, so okay, let me give you a brief uh, summary. Maybe there's some questions. So uh, this is just a candidate proposal. So I don't know how many of you've written a proposal. It's just a short document uh, which is basically proposing, hey, this is what I'm going to do for the next eight weeks. Okay. Um, and generally, sometimes proposals also have some preliminary work done, which uh, you know really depends on um, on the project scope and what the project is about. Uh, so what do you mean by that, right? So you propose, let's say you're going to build a model to uh, uh, forecast you know cryptocurrency prices, okay, just randomly. Uh, then a preliminary work for that would be to at least uh, have an API access or some data set. Uh, with a with a universe defined of what cryptocurrencies you want to track, and uh, uh, and also some idea of what types of models you want to build, and which uh, which uh, and also some specific directions you want to pursue. Because you can always build models that have some forecasting power, but that's a very you know that's as you know bland as it can be. So you want to kind of investigate uh, uh, different things uh, like the effect of um, external, you know, sh shocks or sources of information. Like maybe the news articles trending that week have influence on the crypto prices, uh, uh, or uh, things like that. So that's an example of a proposed project. But you need to have a good sense of that is accomplish accomplishable over eight weeks. Um, and one of the uh, if you look at the project notebook here, it mentions one of the things you. Um, or at least I'm mentioning it right now, one of the things you should kind of plan for is the actual plan of what you're going to do, which is, uh, you know, a project plan, basically. So you can say like week one and two, I'm going to do this, or uh, week three, you know, uh, team member one is going to do this, team two, team member two is going to do this. Uh, it's just a plan, okay? You may not exactly follow that, you know, it is refinable, but uh, you need to have a good plan of what's going to happen in the next, next eight weeks, okay? And... Uh, it is important because there are actually meetings. Uh, there's a meeting uh, actually next week. Uh, there's going to be a meeting with each group uh, separately. And for that, you need to go to the uh, Excel sheet. Uh, there's a tab called meetings. Uh, uh, and in the meetings tab, you should choose a slot for yourself. Okay. Um, so I need to double check during the break whether there are NF slots for NF teams because there are some teams which are of size one. Uh, but I'll do that. Uh, so that's that's the. Uh, uh, but my chain of thought is basically that you should have a decent proposal because there are actually contacts with the teaching staff, and you can't just have a random proposal and then eight weeks later you do something. There has to be, uh, you know, a very well thought out effort or at least effort planned uh, 
uh, because there's going to be conversations with uh, the teaching staff uh, multiple times, actually. Uh, I see at least twice, actually twice, um, currently as it's planned. Although the number of teams is higher, so maybe uh, we might have to repurpose this one as a, you know, um, uh, potentially a project presentation slot, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that. But uh, uh, there's a multiple meeting uh, points, and those are really to brainstorm, like, is your project scope too complex, you know, what exactly the task you're doing, maybe sometimes even it could even be a debugging event, uh, whatever it is, you know, you want to obviously make good use of the time with the teaching staff, but, um, and you can also meet outside of these meeting points also. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, yeah, previously we used to have TES, but uh, this semester we don't have, yeah. There are, currently, we have planned three meeting uh, meetings. That's afterwards. One of them is right after you submit your report. So hopefully that'll be fresh. And the, the first meeting is mostly uh, have a, I mean, me having an informal conversation with uh, each team, uh, just going over their, going over your reports, uh, just to kind of uh, feel for, uh, are you completely off in terms of what is expected? Uh, is it too ambitious? Generally, for example, you know, you can't build a new GPT five or GPT six. Okay, that's not possible. Uh, so, you know, things like that. So just uh, level setting is is what, uh, you know, is, is being, is, is the scope for that meeting. Um, but also, yeah, in general to clarify if there are, if I have questions and if the plan is uh, off in certain aspects, yeah. So that's what an intermediate report is, really a proposal. Just to summarize uh, back to what I uh, mentioned in the beginning. Any questions here? What if uh, we submit a proposal, but maybe towards the end it doesn't work? No, whether the whether you're able to execute all parts of your plan is not a big deal. Like you may be able to execute only eighty percent. Maybe you have executed hundred percent, and now you need to want to do something more. That's all fine. Whether you fall short or not, that's a, just a question of iteration. And it's not going to be a you know it's not going to be a blind spot, right? That's the whole point of these meetings. We will actually be in check of where we are in terms of what we need to accomplish and uh, uh, or at least what we plan and we can always change the plan. So plan is not set in stone as in that's what you need to deliver uh, eight weeks later. It's more of you really thinking through, okay, if this is my candidate trajectory, uh, this is the workload for different people. This is what we need to do. Maybe we just have to get data, which is already curated. Maybe we have to scrape data uh, or maybe we have to request some uh, uh, organization uh, to give data, uh, you know, like for example, medical data, uh, there are, you know, uh, publicly available data sets, but you need a permission from the uh, uh, from a from a nonprofit or appropriate organization which is holding the data uh, that you're not going to misuse it. So there are many things that can you know influence the trajectory of the project. Yeah. Uh, any questions about this? What kind of projects we expect from this? Uh, should be a more complex model or should be a linear with a more conception? Uh, so yeah, I think last time somebody asked even like a slide deck for uh, one of these projects from previous semesters, I think. Uh, so I did not share a slide deck because I didn't want to influence uh, influence your uh, 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 creativity basically. So there is a creativity component, by the way, if you go to the project notebook, uh, which is different from maybe my other class, some of you have taken. Uh, this has uh, like four dimensions in addition to clarity, uh, uh, content correctness. There's also creativity. Uh, so how complex? It really depends on whether you are dealing with a really complex pre-trained model or not. If it's already a complex pre-trained model where doing, just doing inference is hard, uh, then there's really no way of fine-tuning or doing any other type of activity. Uh, but I would not want to give general comments uh, because it really depends on what your project is about. Um, it's not about you making a project super complex, okay? So you don't have to be like, uh, you know, very, um, um, I would say very stressed about that complexity, but as a benchmarking process, uh, your assignments, which are worth 10 points, had some amount of complexity, right? Uh, two questions, how many hours you took? Uh, you know, we gave a budget of two weeks there, uh, but I don't know how many hours, you know, you took perhaps 10 hours, uh, five hours per question, uh, then, Five times that, or actually six times that, is the uh, is the time and bandwidth and effort uh, that you should put in. 
uh, I plan to put it. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, I'm just roughly giving you some numbers, but um, it'll, it'll be clear. So I, I don't know if you are, if you're if you're not sure about the complexity at all, then we should talk separately. But at least this checkpoint will ensure that if you make it made it too complex, I will ensure that it is it is at the right complexity. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of like the context of like the courses you're going, do you want us to kind of stay in the realm of like English classification or training like a language model versus I know you mentioned like medical data? Like yeah. So one semester we did that. We did a thematic project only on object detection. So everybody was doing something on object detection, but very nuanced like it's not a first order not just setting up an object detection model but doing something very specific under the umbrella uh, but uh this time i think we can keep it open so people can do uh, we're not going to restrict to a theme so you some teams can choose language models since there's a lot of, lot of things going on in there except you will not be able to train or fine tune models uh, just be cognizant of that you may be able to fine tune the smallest ones uh, that are you know using some reference uh ideas that are out there in uh, other places but uh yeah you can choose anything on uh, tech side or vision side or anything else that's so i'm not trying to restrict this time but i have done that version before yeah yeah so it really uh depends on the uh, uh how much depth you have on time you want to dedicate and i would say choose a project certainly which you want to kind of showcase somebody else it is going to be one of the most complex projects, given this is a business school program. Um, you know, potentially this could be a more complex uh, technical project in your spectrum of uh, whatever portfolio of projects you've done. Um, what's it? Interactive project. What's it? Interactive. You can make it interactive. Oh, yeah, there can be different types of projects. So interactivity is a different uh, is a potential feature of your project, right? So you could make it. Yeah. Um, so about the data sets, for example, if we're going for image classification or probably something to do with yeah. images, yeah. how uh, large do you think we should aim the data set to be? Oh, it's not really the size of the data set. Uh, really, I think one of the comments I think I gave in the transfer learning section of our lecture series was that uh, I really try to use pre-trained models, which means, you know, I know I'm giving you a hint already, but basically, something like models already there and having face hub or something equivalent uh, and really try to use more of these pre-trained models or in general foundation models or whatever name you want to call them uh, because if you the moment you have high resolution images and you want to train something from scratch even if it's a cnn it is a lot of effort um, i mean as you did in assignment two right assignment two question one is about just fine tuning sfr10 data which is not even which is like 32 cross 32 size images, which was uh, not too hard, but also not too easy uh, unless you had access to GPU. So all I'm saying is uh, we can we can um, probably discuss uh, specific details. If you have an image type of project, it's fine. Um, you know, I, you know, ideate and plan. Obviously, there'll be resource requirements for any project. Uh, just be aware that um, how you're going to get those resources. OK. Um, as I said, for example, just as a, a sense of, uh, if you want to get an A100 GPU, uh, it's about $3 an hour, which seems like a lot, which is a lot, actually, if you want to continuously have it on for like two weeks, uh, sorry, eight weeks. But um, you can always do some strategies where you check for the correctness of the code on a smaller GPU, ensure that it works on a small sample. And then once you're like really sure, you know, burning like 10 bucks or 20 bucks for um, like five hours of training or something is, is, is still okay. I mean, Obviously, A100 is on the higher end. Um, on on more higher end is like eight times A100, which is typically used for fine tuning some of these large language models. Um, but on the smaller end, there are smaller GPUs that you can rent also. So don't be limited. Uh, given 2024, maybe in 2020, 2019, or 2014, it was probably diff different. Uh, but don't be shy of like um, getting the right resources and, um, and and getting your project done. Yeah, Collab has Collab Pro, for example, if you want to just upgrade for a month, it's fine, right? So 20 bucks or 10 bucks is fine. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I, I think I spent a lot of time on projects, but uh, that's what's coming up next. I mean, hopefully this is a calm week before the storm of next week comes in. Uh, but don't worry. I mean, I, this, this, the reason why the checkpoints is to kind of ensure that each one of you is on the right trajectory for, for, for the project. And, and at the same time, do take it seriously. It's six times... Uh, 
uh, the grade of a assignment. Um, so uh, do want to put in like some time and effort in your project and choose a project which depends depending on your domain. If you want to get into healthcare or finance or whatever domain marketing, um, perhaps you want to align your project to that so that you can kind of talk about it perhaps in the future or showcase it as an example. Okay, uh, so that's about projects. Uh, assignment two grades, gradings are done, but we did not discuss, sorry, assignment. Yeah, assignment two gradings are done. Assignment three, last time was the submission deadline. Uh, our 20th is a submission deadline and we did not discuss in detail um, the assignment solutions or at least some hints about that. Um, now it's, uh, I, I think since I spent already 20 minutes on this, uh, I will try to see if we have time towards the end to discuss assignment three, but I'll grade them um, over the next week and I'll get back to you. Uh, so I'll skip the assignment three discussion for now and get back to our uh, language modeling, which is, so what are we gonna do today is uh, just uh, the first part will be pretty, um, pretty high level, but it's gonna kind of make you recap what did we discuss in the previous two lectures, both uh, RNN and LSTM lecture, as well as the lecture on transformer uh, model. We'll do a little bit of recap. I mean, last time was the uh, transformer model and then a use of a pre-trained model for uh, sentence classification or sentiment classification type of an application. So today we'll briefly talk about BERT as an example, pre-trained model, uh, and just talk about some of these models that came before ChatGPT. Okay. Uh, the ChatGPT and uh, current models are uh, pretty uh, advanced, uh, but for today's scope, we'll just try to uh, limit ourselves to the time frame of let's say 2017 to 2020, okay? <laughs> Which is a few years ago, but it's not that old, you know, it's pretty recent. Um, and, and then we'll talk about newer models potentially in a later um, session. Okay. And, uh, and that's because the first bucket is gonna be about just wrapping up transformers and, and some idea of models that were developed three, four, three years ago, let's say, four years ago. And then uh, uh, we're gonna start talking about unsupervised deep learning. Um, which is something that we've not seen so far. We've been mostly talking about supervised learning uh, models. Um, and so we look at, uh, we're starting new mode and unsupervised learning model. And uh, and so that's the scope for today. Let me just mention the explicit le lecture goals. So the first part, it's gonna be about uh, just understanding the key characteristics, characteristics of BERT and uh, one of the characteristics, you know, one of the simplest characteristics is about, hey, we used, we saw an example of using BERT last time as a way to go from a sentence or a movie review basically to a vector and then just to a, a simple logic regression. Uh, and so we'll see how it's different from a word to vec. Okay, so there's gonna be uh, just that, that's a simple characteristic, but worth un appreciating it and understanding why, you know, why there's a difference between word to vec or glow or past text versus BERT. Uh, and then we'll also see some other, uh, details about how a transform, how the transformer block that we discussed in length last at length last time, uh, will be used uh, as a block in the BERT model. Okay? And the way it's used in the BERT model is a little bit different from how it's used in the GPT model. Uh, but it's you know we saw the transformer architecture in the sequence in in the translation setting, but we have to kind of step out of the translation setting and just think of other applications. And so uh, we'll see BERT and some relation to other architectures, other transform-based architectures, okay? Uh, in also other LSTM-based architectures also. So it's gonna be a little bit high level, but uh, let's see how um, how it goes. And uh, today we'll look at, uh, obviously what is, the, what is meant by generative modeling and uh, what are what are autoencoders and what are variational autoencoders? Okay, most of, some of these words may be new to some of you or maybe most of you, uh, but we'll kind of understand what is autoencoding uh, and what is meant by variational and, and stuff like that. Okay. And in general, what is generative modeling? I think Gen AI has become a buzzword, but uh, there was a traditional meaning of what was generative modeling versus discriminative modeling. I think you might have seen it in uh, 575 or some other course, uh, but we'll kind of recap that. Okay. So that's the agenda and goals. Any questions here of what we're doing? So we are going to do a transition back from text to images because uh, that's going to be the example in our unsupervised deep learning uh, part of this uh, lecture series. So 
make a back. So I'm going to start from slide 88 uh, because the previous one was just pre-trained burden embeddings being used for movie classification, movie, I guess, review classification. Uh, so where are we in that, in that slide deck? We are basically, uh, we finished, I mean, last time uh, we did a recap or maybe we talked about uh, attention and sequence sequence modeling. Uh, then we talked about the transformer architecture with self-attention and all the other blocks. Uh, feed forward as well as the layer normalization and all sorts of skip connections. So there were a few details. Um, and then I looked at a pre-trained uh, NLP model, which is called distal BERT. Okay, the word distal BERT uh, kind of actually corresponds to using uh, using the BERT model and trying to make a smaller version of that model. Okay, it's called distillation. Um, uh, it just means that if you have a well-trained model that's heavyweight, maybe has a billion parameters, but if you only have budget for like holding 20 million parameters or 10 million parameters, uh, or even from going from billion scale to a million scale, you can just use the billion scale model as like a, a as a model as a proxy for data set, and then train a smaller model on uh, using this bigger model. So how do you do that? You can just use uh, some input data for which the billion scale model would give you the labels and use that labels as uh, targets in when you're training the smaller model. Okay, that's just called uh, a knowledge distillation. Uh, and there are different types of distillation, but that's why there's a word distill in the front, okay? In the model that we saw last time. We'll come back to that in a, again in a second. We'll now start with the last bullet point, which is BERT and related architectures. Okay. Let me get rid of this. So BERT, I mean, last time we saw the acronym and we actually gonna disambiguate the acronym uh, this time, uh, bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. Okay, and there's a wiki page, you can look at it. Uh, it's a really good uh, informative. And now that you have the background in deep learning, you can probably parse that page pretty well and understand, understand the context. Um, it's a relatively new method uh, for, for getting, you know, for getting language representations. Okay, uh, And uh, obviously it has been circumvented by many, many new architectures are, which are all probably based on transformers today. Uh, many, many architectures, but this, this figure just showing a bunch of architectures that uh, were present three years ago, okay, three, four years ago. Actually, there are papers to this and we'll probably open a couple of them uh, maybe during the break or after the break. Um, so these are actually the names given to the models, the transformer, open air transformer, ULM fit, Elmo and BERT. Okay? These are just names of a bunch of models. And a couple of them are actually based on uh, RNNs. Okay, so for example, Elmo is based on uh, LSTMs and we'll see its architecture in a second. Um, but we want to focus on BERT. Okay? Instead, of, instead of like really jumping between architectures, let's just focus on focus on kind of just spending a bit more time on BERT. Um, and uh, for that, uh, let me see why are we studying, you know, so what happened, right? So this is the pre-GPT uh, era, okay? Uh, GPT-3 era, let's say, uh, or... GPT 3.5 and therefore chat GPT and all that. So this is between uh, somewhere between 2018, beginning of 2018 uh, to 2019, just two years time span is when all these models started coming out based on the transformer architecture, right? So the transformer paper was from fall 2017, um, right? So around that time, obviously RNNs uh, uh, were also pretty popular for modeling national language related tasks, uh, including language modeling. So here's the model called ELMO. It is based on LSTMs and it's pretty, sm pretty small. So the y-axis is representing the number of parameters in billions. So here 10,000, uh, sorry. Uh, I guess it, it's millions. Um, so so 10,000 means 10 billion here. Okay, 10 billion is this line here and uh, here 2.5 billion and so on. So today, if you have downloaded any of these pre-trained large language models, if you recall, like the smallest one will be 2.8 billion, uh, the bigger one would be 7 billion and so on. I don't know, has anybody tried any large language model, uh, downloading a large language model? No? Okay, um, so there are a lot of uh, folks, a lot of companies are in just, I guess, research groups who have um, 
publicly provided these weights. Okay, you don't have to rely on ChatGPT four or ChatGPT, not just Chat, sorry, just GPT four or three point five or any of these uh, Gemini and others. They are proprietary services, but they're equivalent. Um, uh, I guess you can call it open source, but they're basically publicly providing weights uh, with some license uh, licenses. Uh, uh, for example, non-commercial use and things like that. But um, you should try, uh, so some many of these models come at different uh, number of parameters. So for example, Llama is the most famous one uh, from uh, Meta, uh, which has its lots of derivatives, but Llama model family, uh, Llama 2, actually has uh, a model that's uh, 3 billion parameters, which will be somewhere around here in, on the, uh, I guess, um, um, on the y-axis. Uh, and then uh, there's a Llama 7 billion model, then there's a Llama 35 billion model, and there's a Llama 70 billion model. So there are like four models in this canonical family, and obviously there are a lot of derivatives. Um, so just to give a sense of like, what is the number of parameters in these models, uh, in these transformer-based models. So Elmo is not transformer-based, it's a LS LSTM-based. And if you recall LSTM, there was a reuse of uh, the LSTM block uh, or LSTM cell, uh, depending on whatever the sequence length was. So these models are gonna be small. Uh, OpenAI back in 2018 uh, worked on a transformer-based architecture, which is called GPT, uh, which had which had about 110 million parameters. Okay, it's a uh, it's very small uh, compared to what's today. And BERT uh, in the fall of 2018 um, produced a model called BERT, uh, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about in the next few slides. Um, and since then, uh, you know, there's also another Elmo GPT-2, which happened in. Uh, 20, 2019, I guess, uh, mid 2019. Uh, and then GPT 3 happened, I guess, in 2021, perhaps. Uh, but that is not actually, this is not the right point. I just put it with uh, on the PowerPoint. But uh, GPT 3 had 175 billion parameters. Okay, so it's, this is just 10 billion, this line. So this is really exponentially big. But now, since then, people have figured out all sorts of scaling. I guess they call it scaling loss of how big the model size should be and how much data is there. And depending on that, how, how the performance could be. Okay. Uh, and so the model that we saw last time, uh, which, uh, which was released in, I guess, mid uh, or late 2019, it's called Distill Bird. Uh, that's the model that we saw as an example of a pre-trained model to be used for sentence classification or getting an embedding okay, of, a, of a sentence, basically. Um, any questions about this trajectory of what happened on, on those two, three years? Uh, obviously, since then, there's a lot more that has happened. And I think uh, in my first lecture, I had shown a, a different graph where, um, which I can show it, but I'll show it perhaps during the break. I didn't open it yet. Um, where it's the same graph with a bunch of these models, but it, it continues from 2021 and it shows still 2023 or 2024 what happened. Okay, I'll, I'll probably re rehash it, but if you have, Oh, lecture one is not recorded well, but okay, I'll I'll show it again. Um, maybe during the break. So, so where does Bird fall? Twenty eighteen. Okay, just to give a sense, like that's when Transformer was invented as an architecture, and so pretty recent uh, model. So why Bird? Right? Why are we looking at Bird? Although it's a little bit of a you you can call it as a predecessor for most modern LLM hype that's going on. Um, so. The reason why we're looking at it is because back in 2018, um, this model was actually as good as humans in uh, a couple of, in a task called Squared, okay? Squared is just a data set. I just think of like MNIST data, right? Uh, so Squared is a data, data set, uh, which, which stands for, I guess, stands for question answering data set. And basically, um, you know, there's a data set where you have a question, you have a Wikipedia article, and the answer is a phrase within the article. And, uh, and so the modeling problem is given the question and the article just find which phrase is the answer. Okay, that's that's the data set. And so it looks, you know, it looks like a prediction problem. Um, so on that, um, uh, EM just stands for exact match. So you're getting the right phrase to the answer as well as, you know, something called F1 score, which I think people have done 572 or 575. F1 score is just a, uh, some combination of precision and recall. Okay, uh, which are some standard measures in uh, retrieving uh, information. So, so you can see that it was pretty good compared to human performance. Okay, so at that time, um, so that's why we're looking at it. And in general, like at that point, 
you know there are lots of leaderboards today there's hugging face maintains multiple leaderboards uh, at that time uh, this model bert uh, did really well uh, on this on these measures basically uh, compared to other models um, and since then if you go back to that if you go to that the, so the leaderboard link i don't think i've shown it here but if you go back to the link you'll see many other models now dominating bert but at that time it was good and it also did well in other some other tasks okay i'm not going to expand all these tasks NLI just stands for natural language inference. Um, so there are multiple other tasks in beyond the Stanford question answering tasks that it did well. Okay. So anyway, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at it because it, it was the state of the art for a period of time. Uh, and uh, so then given that context, okay, maybe it's interesting enough. Let's look at it as a case study. Um, so what is Bert trying to do, right? So basically it's trying to... Uh, kind of improve on the static uh, word to vec and these types of pre-trained models that were available six years before it. Okay, so 2012, sorry, 2012 uh, or 2013 was when word to vec was released, about 10 years ago, right? Uh, and then uh, six years later, uh, BERT model came about and it, and people, started, people said it can be used for pre-trained, uh, so sorry, it can be used as a pre-trained model for downstream NLP tasks. Okay, that's the that's the context. You can replace word to vec with BERT and you can get embeddings, but now the embeddings are gonna be better, okay, in some sense. Uh, how are they gonna be better? Uh, we'll see in the next slide, but uh, what does BERT do? Okay. Uh, it did, you know, unsupervised is, I guess, a word which even word to vec was unsupervised. Uh, basically, there's no explicit supervision. Uh, you just get a text corpus. You create your own problem, auxiliary problem, generally. And that's what we did, right? We said, okay, let's predict nearby words or something. Um, so you don't need annotated data. Uh, so you basically think thinking of like a building a language model. And it was also uh, bi-directional, okay? uh, which was at that point, you know, in hindsight, it seems uh, obvious, but uh, at that point it was kind of okay uh, and a new, I guess a new thing. Um, and and given these features, it was doing really well uh, uh, as a pre-trained model for downstream tasks. Okay. Uh, one of the downstream tasks which we have already seen is the sentence classification in the previous lecture. Okay, so what is uh, what's the difference, right? So what what is the evolution from word to back to BERT is that. You know, in general, pre-trained representations, pre-trained embeddings of words or sentences uh, can be context-free, and that's word to vec for you, or contextual, which is what this new class of pre-trained models are. Okay, so context-free versus context contextual just means that in word to vec situation, every word will have some vector embedding, and it's going to be the same. It doesn't change as a function of which context the word is in. So uh, somebody was giving the word uh, apple as an example. So apple is going to have the same embedding. Um, irrespective of what context it is used, whether it's it's not you know whether it's the company or whether it's um, uh, the fruit, but obviously there's ways to disable it. Uh, um, so that's the one way to partition. So context-free and contextual. Context-free models are the models that you use in assignment uh, three, uh, Glow or FastX or whatnot. Um, and uh, contextual would be something like uh, the distal bird model that we saw as an example last time. Uh, and in addition to that, contextual representations can be both unidirectional and bidirectional. Okay, uh, so what is the difference? Uh, is basically that when you're looking looking at the context to get a representation of a word, do you look at the words to the left and do you look at the words to the right? Okay, uh, so it turns out that BERT has a uh, when it's when it's training and learning these uh, whatever its its model weights. It's able to look at both words on the left and the right, uh, and then create the context. So at test time, so if you're just doing a forward pass, the representation of a word will depend on uh, both left and right side words. Okay, you may say, okay, that seems very obvious. Why, why not look at words on both sides? Um, but you'll see that if you look at, recall the transform architecture, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, there could be a version where you could only you could you can rely on only on the left side words to uh, create the representation of a word. Okay, so we'll we'll kind of look at that again in a second. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so bidirectionality just means that and contextual just means now we are relying on the sentence to get a representation. So the representation for the same word will not be the same uh, depending on the sentence, okay? So, yeah. So how do, how do we uh, kind of, um, how do, you, how do you go from zero to having this pre-trained model? Okay. Uh, actually, this slide is not really talking about too much, uh, but basically it's uh, this slide is just giving you a very high level of how do you go from a corpus of data? I mean, not how actually, it's just saying that you go from a corpus of data, which is in this middle row uh, to a model like this block, yellow block here, uh, uh, while solving a suitable auxiliary task, right? You just have a corpus, no annotation. I mean, so it's kind of unsupervised which is something that you've already done uh, in the previous couple of lectures. And uh, and then you also suitably need to have a, a prediction uh, objective, okay? So in your assignment, you did already a language model uh, problem, so you are predicting the next word, okay? Uh, but it turns out for BERT, you can also, the way they set up the problem, they also call it a language model, but uh, the way you set up the problem, you're just filling in the, filling in the blanks, okay? So you give a sentence, you randomly drop some words, and then, uh, you want to predict what were the draw words you dropped, okay? So you're not being just predicting the next word, which would be some sort of autoregressive model, but you're just predicting, given a sentence, hey, here's a bunch, you know, a couple of words that I dropped, here's a word that I dropped, can you predict that one, okay? So, uh, so that was a slight difference in terms of, yeah. Is it like the last word is kind of accuracy? No, no. So you, so we'll like actually look at the architecture. We just drop some words and like, uh, in the model, we are checking that the model is giving the correct word. Or predicting that word. Yeah. Yeah. For creating a, just a, this is exactly the same. Instead of predicting a distribution over the next word, which is on the vocabulary that you guys did. Like the cross check. Yeah. It's just trying to predict what is the most likely word that you will fill in the blank. And is it the same as what is the naturally occurring in the data set in the, for that example? Right. So, uh, uh, and and that's where I, I did not de uh, discuss all the terms. So bidirectional encoder representations. So we did not talk about the encoder. We we'll look at the encoder architecture and it'll become clear why that is uh, kind of uh, you know natural. But it was a slightly different objective. But this slide is just saying that there is you know given the data set, you, they created some objective function, um, and uh, not just that, but like maybe some auxiliary task objective as well, and then got the weights. Once you get the weights you can do exactly what we saw last time. So we we saw last time what we did, we did sentence classification. So we got sentences, tokenized them, pushed them through this, this uh, pre-trained model, uh, looked at the representation for the CLS special token, which was at the beginning, uh, which we added. And then given that, we can just uh, build a simple classifier, which now already has, it's already vectors, already numbers. You can build in any classifier you want, right? So this is just uh, any downstream task uh, you can do. So the bulk of the thing is some, you know, Google train Google in this case, <laughs> Google trained this model on a large corpus and provided the weights for fo folks to use. Okay. Um, yeah, so this I think uh, we already saw uh, in the sense that this is what we saw last time towards the last part of last lecture. We just saw how to use a pre-trained model uh, like this. Okay, so just to come back to BERT, uh, just like ResNet has multiple versions and you guys use ResNet 18, I guess, uh, in assignment two, question one, uh, there are BERT small and BERT large, uh, like two models, uh, which which were the canonical models. Distal BERT is a distillation of that one, you know, one of these models. Um, so you can see uh, these models are essentially look like uh, a collection of transformer blocks that we have studied in depth last time. Um, note that we are not in, so the specific architecture that we saw where there was an encoder, stack of encoders and stack of decoders only made sense because we were doing translation, okay? That's not the trans that, that's not the transformer architecture. Transform is really about the transform block and reusing it in whatever way. Uh, so you can see that there's a bunch of encoders here and I guess the larger version is more encoders. Um, so it, it's using encoders and that's why in the name of this, I guess in the acronym, there's the encoder word, okay? Uh, and actually with, uh, with this, it should be more clear, like why they can have an objective function which can which can be like a masking of a word uh, in a, in your sentence. Okay. Uh, firstly, I guess like some statistics. Uh, the number of encoder units is twelve or twenty four. Uh, I think in our illustrative illustration last uh, slide deck, uh, or I guess the beginning part of the slide deck, we we saw six for for example. 
uh, second thing, uh, they have like certain dimensions, 768 and 1024, just like uh, word 2 vec had like 300, right? Uh, as a dimension of the embeddings. Uh, similarly, the number of attention heads is 12 or 16. Uh, in our example, illustrative example last lecture, we were talking about eight attention heads, I think, in the illustration. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, also this uh, this length of number of number of parallel words or tokens that you can ingest. Uh, it's uh, 512 for this model uh, compared to like 20 or something that we were looking at last time uh, in the illustration. Okay, this is called context length, and this is where uh, there's a lot of uh, you know innovations also happen happening in the past year and a half where context length gradually moved from 500 to 1000 to 2000 to 16,000 to 32,000 all the way to 120,000 uh, and so on. So a lot of new transformer models have really large context lengths, okay, which makes them really really complex uh, things to train. Uh, so so BERT model, since you saw uh, in the previous figure that we, there's a bunch of encoder units on top of each other. So you can imagine that, you know, you can pass a sentence like this and uh, uh, get representations for each of the words in your input tokens um, uh, out, okay? So to get that, I mean, you just use the encoder units of the transformer architecture that we, we talked about. So uh, given this, you know, you can see that why we could mask a word and predict it because uh, you know you can just you can just ignore all the computations happening here and then just wait for the last layer to kind of uh, see what uh, what is the attend you know what is the representation that is getting generated by not having like blanking out let's say uh, Mayuko uh, as a word here uh, you can just uh, see what representation you've got given the nearby words and hopefully the representation is such that when you convert it into a distribution of words, hopefully that word has a higher probability. Okay. That's how you are learning um, language patterns in the weights of these encoder units. Okay. So that at a test time, when you have a new sentence, it understands what word, uh, you know, how words are related to each other. Okay. And that's how you get contextual representations. Um, yeah, I think this is just details that we already saw, some dimensionality. And in particular, this extra token is something that was used while training. Obviously, you can't just have a new token randomly at test time and um, not be present at training time. And, and there are some ways to deal with that uh, if, it's not, if they're not special tokens. But CLS stands for classification as a special token. Okay. Um, and that's the token that we used last time for doing that uh, pre-trained uh, when using the distal birth model for uh, using it as a pre-trained model for classification. Any questions here of uh, just kind of, we are just recapping things that we've seen last time and just putting it in the context of BERT. Okay, so yeah, and this, I don't I don't think I wanna repeat this. This is just exactly the same as, uh, uh, we're just saying that this process is very similar to having a pre-trained model image encoder encoding an image, and then you're just doing some, uh, uh, you know, adaptation. This is exactly assignment two, uh, uh, question one that you did. Okay, so now let's talk about some friends. Uh, I will still focus on BERT, but we'll, let's talk about a couple of uh, models that came around the same time. Uh, it was actually not BERT, but uh, other another architecture called ELMO, uh, which actually kind of pioneered the idea of contextual contextual representation. So this whole leap from uh, word to work or first fast text to uh, some representation which is contextual was uh, kind of one of the uh, initial papers was this paper called Elmo. Uh, it's actually six months before BERT or eight months before BERT uh, appeared. So the idea is that a word can have different meanings depending on the context, pretty natural. And this was not captured at the time, you know, using the predominant pre-trained models, pre-trained, I guess, uh, embeddings that were there. So what is uh, ELMO? Uh, ELMO is basically looks at the entire sentence uh, before embedding each word, and it's based on LSTMs, um, and it's trained as a language model. Okay. So trained as a language model, LSTMs just mean that exactly the assignment three question, uh, yeah, question one that you did, uh, where you had an LSTM architecture for, uh, you know, to learn a language model, where you literally were predicting the next word. Okay, that's the training task. Use a huge corpus, train your uh, uh, this ELMO model, which is essentially an LSTM-based architecture, 
uh, and once you predict the next word, you have hopefully in the weights of the network, you have language patterns involved, uh, sorry, language patterns uh, learned so that when you get a new sentence, you can get embeddings, okay? But how do you get uh, embeddings uh, has a couple of more bells and whistles. I mean, just some details. Um, so let's actually see that. So uh, as I said, Elmo pioneered the idea of uh, bidirectional, uh, sorry, uh, of not just bidirectionality, but context actually. So here's language model ta modeling task, right? First of all, uh, now we have LSTM la num layers is equal to two. So if you remember the LSTM uh, API signature of that function, uh, or that, sorry, that class, um, there's a num underscore layers is equal to one by default in PyTorch, and uh, you could change it to two. All it changes is like adds one more LSTM layer. So each of these circular things here is a LSTM cell, okay, one LSTM operation, right? Um, so this we have already seen, and this is exactly what you did in assignment three, uh, which is given a sentence, let's stick to, uh, hopefully at this point, your output should be a distribution of words where maybe improvisation has the highest uh, probability compared to all the other words in the vocabulary, okay, right? So this uh, is just a language modeling task, exactly assignment three. Hopefully this should not be new, uh, except there's a number of layers is equal to two. Uh, so if you if you eliminated one of these layers, it would be exactly assignment three's uh, question. Um, any questions here? No? Okay. So now, um, what uh, Elmo did is a couple of things. Uh, you know, we're going to get these contextual representations, but we're also going to take into account bidirectionality. Okay. So it was not just BERT, but Elmo also had a um, uh, bidirectionality aspect to it, which is, you know, forward model, a uh, forward language model is what you'd call it. Uh, you would create, uh, you know, you'd use let's stick to, and then you'd get a distribution or improvisation, uh, but you do a forward pass this way. But you also do a pass where you are just literally reversing the sentence, okay? Uh, and uh, passing to should predict stick, stick should predict uh, let's, and so on. Okay, so you're going the opposite way. Okay, two different LSTMs, basically. One going forward in, in the sentence, the other one going backward in the sentence. Okay, two different RNN, uh, you know, whatever, for loops, okay? Uh, so given these two, now we wanna generate embeddings. Remember, we're not just focusing on language modeling, which is what you did in assignment three. Uh, we wanna get contextual embeddings. So the way we'll do it is, okay, now we're gonna focus on one of the steps. Okay, let's say, let's focus on the word stick in, a, in the sentence. Uh, maybe it appeared here and maybe it appeared here in the forward and backward passes. What we'll look at is, okay, what was its initial embedding? Maybe a word to vector embedding, the green, green vectors here. Then we'll look at the, uh, the LSTM directly, the hidden vector corresponding to the LSTM cell there, uh, the uh, hidden outputs for that LSTM cell. And then the next LSTM cells hidden outputs, okay? Now what we're gonna do is just use these to get the contextual, uh, define the contextual embedding for the word stick. Okay, so how are we doing that? So you can see that, uh, the way we'll do it is take this green uh, vector and this green vector, concatenate them. That's one candidate uh, uh, representation, but it's really not uh, contextual anymore, contextual because there's nothing we did. Uh, in the LSTM cell, at least this hidden vector and this hidden vector, they are informed by words to the left and words to the right. So maybe you know these hidden vectors are contextual. Let's concatenate them. That's this vector here. And let's concatenate the top one as well. Uh, concatenate together. That's this vector here. So we got three pairs of elongated vectors, concatenated vectors, one at each level, okay, for the same word, related to the same word, okay? And then you can just do a weighted averaging of that, and that weighted average vector is, they define uh, as the contextual representation of that word stick uh, in a sentence. So, uh, does, this, does this make sense? This is a very, uh, so you had a forward pass language model that we already worked on in the assignment, just think of it reversing the sentence and building a model. And now, uh, every time you get a new sentence, if you train these these two models, every time you get a new sentence, focus on a word and just look at the hidden vectors that got generated when you did a forward and backward pass. And uh, those hidden vectors just concatenate them and do a weighted averaging across across levels. Okay, in this case, they're only input uh, and then two levels of the LSTM blocks. Uh, concatenate them and do a weighted averaging and that's your representation. So that's the innovation from, from, from this paper. It's not even that old. It's only five, five and a half years old. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so, so that was Elmo. And then, yeah. So this 
contextual uh, embedding just was it is relevant for just this let's stick to phase. Right. For example, if we get stick in another situation. Yeah. Like pick up this thing, right? Yeah. So, We'll have a different embedding for that. Yes, yeah, because this embedding, this uh, LSTM output obviously depends on the previous input, right? So let's is influencing this embedding, and then two is influencing this embedding, right? So if you look at the previous slide, uh, let's is influencing this this hidden vector output, and then two is influencing this hidden vector output, right? But if we get a similar, uh, a different phase, we'll have two embeddings, uh, different. Right? Yeah, so we'll get different embeddings for the word stick depending on the sentence. That's the whole point. Having so the whole shift of Elmo, Bert was not the first thing to do do this contextual embedding business, right? So what I'm trying to say is that word to vec, it doesn't matter what words around you, you get the same embedding. Now we are moving to a paradigm where the words around you influence what embedding you have. So the word stick in this, you know, let's stick to something improvisation has some embedding for the word stick. And if you think of a very different sentence which involves the word stick, it'll have a very different embedding. For sure, yeah. So yeah, in this example, since we're only looking at one sentence, there will be some embedding of the word, for the word stick. But if you change the words on the left and right of the word stick, then it's gonna be different embedding, yeah. Okay. Any questions? It's overload or? Just to give a sense of like, I mean, this phase is a little bit, at least uh, there are a few popular models in 2023, 2024, there are like so many popular models, it's kind of hard to study. Uh, so it's a good case study to kind of understand the historical context of how these evolved. Um, so the next model, uh, so just, just to give you a sense, right? So what are we looking at? Uh, sorry, I'm going too many slides back. Wanted to just show you this trajectory again. So Elmo is what we just looked at, okay? This is the one that is looking at the bio, the contextual embedding. And now we're gonna briefly talk about uh, basically something like GPT. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and then come back to BERT. Okay? Because GPT and BERT are transformer architecture. So we just wanna talk about at least one LSTM model. Uh, and that's what, that's what we did. Yeah, so what, uh, so after ELMO, which is about LSTMs, we said, okay, we know transformers. They were just released uh, six months ago. Let's look at uh, some way to use pre-trained transformers. Okay, and that led to this open AI transformer uh, architecture. Um, and uh, what it did was use language modeling and just the decoders uh, of the, the same decoders that we saw last time. It's exactly the same as the transformers encoder block, except there's an extra uh, potential encoder decoder uh, decoder um, layer actually, yeah, that layer will not be, um, okay. Uh, okay. Let me not take that back. So there's an extra layer that we saw last time. Uh, but coming back to this, this is an architecture where they, they did the same language modeling thing that we did with Elmo, but now with the transformer block in particular transformers decoder block. Okay. Why decoder block? Because they are trying to basically do exactly what we did with LSTM so in, in assignment as well, which is to predict the next word. Okay, they are always predicting the next word, which is basically an auto-regressive model. Uh, so, um, uh, so how do you do that? You when you're computing uh, the uh, representation, like when you're doing self-attention for any word, you don't look at the future words uh, inputs influence on on your computation. So that's how you kind of, and, and that's how you, and we had to do this even when we're decoding in the uh, machine translation example. So when we're creating one word at a time, obviously there's no future word, so it's all zeros basically. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that they stick to language modeling, but uh, but keep the autoregressive objective of predicting the next word. Okay. Um, and uh, obviously now we know that transformer-based architectures are really good at keeping long range dependencies and really good at capturing language patterns. Um, so why did they do, right? So basically it's, it's the same thing, let's stick to, and then when we do, let's, let's stick to uh, the last, uh, I guess there is a trajectory, I mean, arrow that I'm not showing, that one's distribution of words should have the, uh, should have a distribution of words such that the improvisation uh, token has the highest probability. That's all. So it's the same thing. Um, 
as uh, as we saw with LSTM, uh, the Elmo model, except um, it's using the transformers decoder blocks. Okay, that's what the OpenAI transformer architecture did. Um, and once you kind of train it, it's exactly the same. So you can say some start token and then uh, write a bunch of words, and you can get a um, get a representation for uh, some sort of summarization of the sentence, and then you can just use a little pre-trained pre -trained embedding for some downstream classification, exactly like the distilled word example. Uh, the reason why I introduced this is uh, this led to uh, many different types of tasks. Okay, this is uh, an example of, this is actually from their paper, uh, the GPT, uh, the OpenAI Transformer paper. And uh, here they show some examples. So they can say, okay, uh, these are tokens that they have uh, also used in the training so that um, you can use them. So for example, start, text, extract. Uh, when you pass these this collection, so basically original text with some special tokens, uh, then you can uh, pass it through this transformer architecture and you can get a vector whose linear transformation will give, will give you, for example, sentence classification. Or you can have a start and then a text, uh, a sentence, then a special token, then another sentence, and then another special token. Then if you pass it through the transformer, this is a really long thing, then you can get a prediction like whether the hypothesis follows the premise. It's called entailment. Similarly, you can have a start, a sentence, a special token, another sentence, uh, and then you have another special token. You get a vector, you get another vector. You can use those two to say whether uh, those two, those two uh, those two sentences are similar. Okay, so this is just to give you a sense of like how they are, how you build on top of the pre-trained model, okay? which is already trained, so that if you give inputs like this, we already saw like using the CLS token, for example, the bird. So where did this come from? Because they are already trained; these green blocks are already trained uh, to kind of handle these situations. Okay, and then once you know that, uh, you can you can actually do the all these types of tasks, which is very very um, common in uh, machine learning. Okay, so what changed? Uh, the reason why I introduced the friends, which is Elmo and OpenAI Transformer, is that um, Elmo was bidirectional, and then came OpenAI Transformer, which is not bidirectional because it's autoregressive. It's only looking at predicting one word, uh, sorry, the next word given the previous uh, words, and using that to give contextual embeddings. Uh, the next idea that led to BERT is basically use transformer-based architecture, but now look at both both words, both sides of the words, uh, sorry, both sides of the sentence. Okay. And that's led to, okay, let's step back and not think of decoder, but actually let's think of an encoder. Okay. Uh, but encoder doesn't have a sense of next word. Uh, you know, all words are getting, get, getting processed together. Okay, and that led to the need for a slightly different objective, which is uh, this uh, predicting a mass word. Okay. Uh, instead of just being autoregressive, you predict a mass word. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the context. So that's why I wanted to kind of give you a sense of, um, where, uh, uh, you know, how it's different from some of the contemporary models that, were, that existed at that time. Any questions here? This is not saying anything more. Uh, it's just saying that there's uh, ideas of masks and using encoders instead of decoders. And this is just exactly the same. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's the same example. So where you can see that there's a word that is masked, I guess improvisation is masked. And, and then you want to ensure that the representation for the word is such that when you do a linear transformation or whatnot, uh, you'll get a distribution of words such that the improvisation might have the highest problem. Okay, that's all, that's all it means, uh, masking here. And only your objective function should pick that signal up and then only focus on that cross entropy and then backdrop. Okay. Um, so actually it turns out you mask about 15% of the tokens. Um, so it's not just more randomly picking one word, it's some proportion. Um, yeah, so here's another um, example. So it's not an example, actually. Uh, so this masking is a way to do language modeling, which is what they did with the corpus. So if you remember the first slide I showed you in this lecture was, hey, there's some data set and we have to train some objective masked objective and we get a pre-trained model. So one of the objectives was just this masking and then predicting that word. And the second objective uh, was uh, this, right? So predict the likelihood that sentence B belongs after sentence A. So for that, uh, 
they have a classifier, a sentence with a mask and a separator, a new new token, another sentence with a mask. And uh, you want to predict whether it's uh, some binary. This is a creation of an auxiliary task, uh, whether it's uh, whether the sentence B follows sentence A or not. And that information, you, all of this information, you don't need special annotation. You just know that in the corpus, whether sentence B follows sentence A, uh, you just get that information. Okay. Um, so given that, it, this is from the, again, that paper, um, BERT paper, uh, it's exactly showing how, you know, just like with the OpenAI transformer paper, they're also showing, hey, if you trained, uh, if you pre-train this model using encoders instead of decoders, which is what OpenAI transformer did, then once you train it, uh, you can just use it for sentence classification. And this top right part is exactly, we went through with this Silbert where you pass a CLS or a classification token and the sentence, and then you just focus on the embedding here and then get a prediction, sentence classification. Or you can do exactly you know, other tasks like sentence pair classification, question answering task, uh, sentence tagging task, and so on. So there are many, many different tasks in NLP and all of the, many of them can be done, not all of them, but a good chunk of them were being, you know, the, 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 uh, can be accomplished once you train this uh, BERT model, pre-train this model, BERT model. Yeah, and there are a lot of acronyms here. They're just names for different types of data sets. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the statement is kind of clear. BERT can be used as a word embedding uh, model, model, just like ELMO, and uh, then embeddings are contextual. So, and the way they do it is very similar to ELMO as well. Uh, for a new, so once you train model, uh, since BERT, if you recall, has 12 or 16 uh, embedding units, sorry, sorry, encoder units. Uh, so let's say it's a, it's a bird small, uh, then which of these vectors do you use in an embedding? So you can always use the last one, but you can also use, you know, there's no specific reason to say, why not use the uh, embedding vector that you get after uh, 11 encoder units? Why not 10 encoder units? So so it's the same idea. Again, you can, you can, you can get many embedding outputs, one per, em, uh, one per encoder uh, block, and you can just do a weighted averaging if you want. Okay. And in fact, they do that. Yeah. I mean, actually, they actually first evaluate whether which embedding is actually useful for the downstream task. And here are some scores. And they see that, okay, some some combination, some of last four hidden has some number, which seems to be the highest. Concat last four hidden has the highest uh, recall in uh, an appropriate task. And so there are many, uh, you know, I guess this is the named entity recognition task, and and so depends on how you wanna uh, represent. Okay, what is the embed? What is the representation of the word? Okay, so there's a lot of so this is all this to show you that uh, not so much to kind of you know memorize or some fundamental idea here that there is so much experimentation that goes in to kind of identify okay what could be a reasonable embedding, contextual embedding, whatever, right? Even with just one canonical model here. Um, any questions? That was like a really, I, that's why I kept it, you know, as I said, it was not too deep, uh, but it's just a kind of an exploration of Bert and friends, um, which is about three years ago, four years ago, uh, the collection of models. Since then, uh, there's a new collection of models now, um, mostly based on transformer architecture, although there are some other what are called state space models also that are becoming popular. Uh, but uh, we'll look at the new collection, at least a, a graph of them uh, right after the break. Um, so I'll not summarize because it's just a repeating of what we just discussed. Any questions? Okay, so if not, um, let me see. Um, next, we'll look at uh, unsupervised learning. So we're really switching gears, okay? And we'll just, uh, I'll just do some introduction and then we can take a break. Um, Yes, I, I keep I keep saying I'll show it after the break. Let me just show it to you now, since we're in the context, and then we'll move on. <laughs> this is a picture I showed in lecture one, uh, which is which starts from around the time 
where the previous picture left off, but it's not the same. You know, it doesn't have an x-axis of the size. Uh, by just showing, you know, a very just a random walk through what all models have been released based on just transformer architecture, okay, uh, since 2019. So, since in 2019, Google released a model called T5. Uh, in 2020, GPT-3, uh, and then there's also Codex and all that. Uh, T0, Flan, 2020, Instruct GPT-2 uh, came around the same time. A uh, lot of different companies. I think you can probably recognize some of the symbols here. Um, and then Palm and ULM, sorry, Palm, I guess is a pretty famous model. And then finally here in 2023, it, I guess 2024 uh, is Llama and GPT-4 and so on. So really uh, took a long time. I mean, it's not a long time, it's just three, four years, but a uh, lot of evolution and really leveraging the scaling effect of uh, having uh, these transformer-based architectures with a lot of um, with a large corpus and transformer architecture, you're able to get really, really good performance in terms of uh, being even able to have products which are like uh, good, helpful assistants in various tasks. Right. So many of you have probably tried or or actively using uh, things like just ChatGPT or Gemini Pro or any of these things. Uh, so it's just the same architecture, but really scaled down. Okay, and that's why they, they um, that's why there are a lot of teams that try to work on this, uh, and they're continuing to work on this today. A any questions about this diagram? It's just showing a trajectory of you know months, what month, what what quarter, what got released. Um, Okay, uh, and and this is just a subset. Okay, this is not even the all the all the models that are available. Um, so I guess a good collection of you know uh, to get a sense of what all uh, models are available. Hugging face or something. Some model have like that would give you a sense uh, of what models are available. Okay, with that, let's uh, do a very brief intro to unsupervised learning, which I, I'm sure some of you have run 575 and 572 know what unsupervised learning is, but it's good to kind of switch gears. Uh, there's a lot going on in text. Many of you will do projects in text, but we'll come back to text uh, a little bit later. Okay. Uh, for now, let's really switch gear back to images, uh, just to get a, get a sense of uh, the other innovation, parallel innovation that is happening in uh, image world today, right? How many of you use DALI? Uh, OpenAI's DALI, okay, or uh, Midjourney. Okay, Midjourney has, a, I think, a Discord that you can just join and just see what other people are creating. Um, yeah. DALI is the one like where you get prompts and it gets videos. Yes, 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 yes. And, you know, there's something called Sora that I believe you guys saw a week ago. DALI is right? Yeah, you can access DALI through ChatGPT or GPT-4, is it? <laughs> your expectations have become too high but uh, you can also use uh, dali directly also uh, it doesn't have to chat gpt or gpt4 or whatever there are multiple interfaces with these things um but yes yeah, stable diffusion and uh, mid journey and uh, dali are some of the players there are many others um, so that parallel revolution revolution there involves um very similar to this other Gen.I component, which is large language models and therefore assistance based on them. Uh, this other category is also about generating new, uh, I guess, images and so on. And which also, which falls in the, I guess, uh, bucket of unsupervised learning. Okay. Um, in a sense, the training uh, of these models uh, was completely unsupervised. Okay. And we'll see some basic models today. I mean, uh, but all these new models also are are, uh, are not completely unsupervised because they have text, they condition on the text uh, to produce something. But we'll, what we'll see today is like completely unsupervised. Uh, even the large language models, they are, you know, if from an uh, observer perspective, they are unsupervised. Although you are internally creating a, a next word prediction problem, like a language modeling problem, the corpus of data doesn't have any explicit annotations. Okay, it's a little bit of a interpretation thing here. And so you would consider that also as an unsupervised uh, model uh, modeling approach, uh, or you can call it self-supervised if you want. Uh, there's some names here, um, but basically it's not supervised learning where you 
uh, where you have explicit annotated data. It is supervised learning at the level of, sure, if you give me corpus, I can always predict the next word, and therefore my next word is a label, but that's just internal to you. Um, and so that's why this whole thing is called Gen AI. Uh, one of the reasons, I mean, not just because it's generating new answers and new responses, uh, but uh, um, because I'm supervised, okay? So, okay, so anyway, let's now switch shift gear to images with, with where there's also a lot of advances going on in 2022, 2023, 2024, uh, but we'll look at the basics of uh, those ideas. Okay. So actually, maybe I should increase the page. Okay. So what we'll do is just uh, get a sense of like just the uh, basics of unsupervised learning and then take a break. Um, Unsupervised learning landscape. Uh, we know what supervised learning is, where you have you have a label, okay, and label is available in your training data, and you explicitly you know learn a learn a black box or some function which maps from features to that that label, right? Uh, unsupervised learning it only involves that those inputs, okay, bunch of images, bunch of text, uh, corpora, whatever it is, and then you're just trying to kind of learn patterns in the data, okay. So uh, how do you learn the patterns in the data? You know, typically you would probably use some of the data to create some proxy targets or labels and then just try to predict that. And that's what we saw with the uh, language models. And we we're just saying, okay, let's take the next word and say, let's, uh, that's my prediction target. Okay. Uh, but we'll see, there are many ways to think of it this way that uh, a priori, there is no explicit labels. You are just, you know, given the corpus, you can try to create some proxy label and then just target that. And that's what's going to create your appropriate objective function because at the end of the day you have to have some objective function right it doesn't have to be always the case that you create a target for example when you think of clustering there's no explicit target but there is an objective of, of thing, separating things out and putting things into uh, i guess buckets or clusters uh, that leads to an objective function but uh, that's one type of objective function but you can also have an objective function which is just cross entropy type of an objective function therefore you create a proxy target okay um Goal is to learn basically some patterns of the data, and there's really no objective measure of success. Okay, so um, uh, that's at least in the traditional unsupervised learning. Uh, when you do clustering, for example, there is no objective measure of success. You interpret whether the clustering is good enough for your application or not. Okay, it's the um, obviously there's some measure of how much clustering has has happened because you were optimizing some objective, but that's not really um, uh, kind of what you care about. You just care about um, some you know interpretation or some downstream objective which is not captured while doing that unsupervised learning task. Okay, so what are some tasks that you already know before? Um, those are the ones I put it in black, and some of the some of the new words uh, maybe from, from this course is what I put it in uh, blue. So clustering, association rules, dimensional reduction, uh, density estimation, embedding, and sampling. Okay, these are some words. I mean there there are others. Um, how many of you are very familiar with clustering? Okay, everybody is familiar with clustering. Uh, K-means is one example. Uh, a, a example clustering, so I'll not talk about it because everybody's familiar with it. Um, how about association rules? How many of you are pretty familiar with association rules? It's covered in 572, right? Association rules are complex? Have. Yeah, uh, there is support and confidence, and then you define lift or whatever based on that. Um, but yeah, it's it's complicated. It uh, it's what thirty years old. Yeah, thirty years old technology. Um, you know, so it's again an unsupervised learning task. Not so much the rules. Rules are you know, rules are basically trying to build a prediction model. Uh, but uh, frequent item sets, which is what I guess uh, is a precursor to creating the rules. Uh, uh, I mean, some of you have heard of uh, algorithms like a priori and FP growth, and there are actually many hundreds of algorithms here, thousands of algorithms, but they all try to kind of look at a collection of kind of categorical objects like sets basically, and then try to look at, oh, what are some frequently occurring sets among these sets of observations I've made? Okay, for example, sets, uh, in in the uh, I guess in the retail application, you can have a grocery basket or a store uh, where you have a collection of items that are purchased, and based on that, you want to say what are the most frequently occurring 
uh, items that are co-purchased, right? Uh, that's a very typical example, one of the canonical examples, but there are many other uh, uses of the same thing. Okay? The moment you have categorical variables, you can think of sets and you can just use association rules also there. Okay, or in general frequent items. So it's unsupervised. Uh, it's not that the objective is different. Even clustering, the objective is not different. So actually, uh, I don't know if I have that. So for example, this clustering, you can actually think of this as like the top view of a two-dimensional space. Okay, you're looking from the top of a two-dimensional space and these clustered areas are where the probability mass is the highest. If you think of three Gaussians, okay, uh, because the three colors in this picture, you can think of three Gaussians sitting on top of, uh, you know, right next to each other. And these clustered areas are where the Gaussian density is the highest. Okay, so it's as if uh, points are coming from the blue Gaussian, the green Gaussian, or the red Gaussian. Okay, and in fact, Gaussian mixture model is a kind of very closely related to k-means. So k-means is like a limiting version of Gaussian, uh, you know, Gaussian mixture model, actually. So if you, I don't know if you have done EM algorithm in uh, fitting Gaussian mixture models. Yes or no? Yeah. Expectation maximization. No. Have you fit Gaussian mixture models? So Gaussian mixture models are also a way to cluster data. So you can just say, hey, my data set is just a mixture of Gaussians. Uh, I have three Gaussians. I don't know what their means are, what their covariances are, but I know that every data point either belongs to one of these Gaussians. Okay. Uh, and so what is your, uh, so given that, uh, given that assumption, you can always fit, oh, fit the data just means that finding out the three means and the three, three standard, you know, standard deviations or whatever covariances. Okay. Uh, and once you fit that, any new point, you can say how far is it from the mean of these each of these three Gaussians, and that's that's how you say it belongs to one of these Gaussians. Okay, it's so exactly the same as this k-means clustering, uh, and so k-means clustering's process, uh, the two-step process that that is there uh, of finding cluster centers and then uh, assigning points, and then given the assignment of points, again re re finding the cluster centers and so on. That iterative process as a very is similar to fitting a Gaussian mixture model. Fitting uh, these sets of parametric models means maximizing likelihood, okay? And a proxy to do that maximization likelihood in case, sorry, a proxy to do likelihood maximization in case uh, that uh, likelihood maximization itself, you know, uh, seems, looks complicated looking is this uh, iterative process of, uh, you know, maximizing some some part of the likelihood and then maximizing some other part of the likelihood. I'm, I'm just kind of grossly, uh, <laughs> Um, simplifying the process, but that's very similar to the k-means process. Okay, just iteratively maximize part of the likelihood, another part of the likelihood, part of the likelihood, another part of the likelihood. Uh, that's exactly like k-means finding the centers, finding assignments, finding centers, and so on. Okay. Um, anyway, for a tangent over there, but Gaussian mixture models. Um, all I wanted to say was that there's a probabilistic intuition for all these clustering processes. It's all about trying to find high probability regions. Okay. So as I said, like if you think of this as a top view. Uh, this area is like the high probability region. You can think of a Gaussian, 2D Gaussian, where maybe this is like the peak of that mountain. And this is the peak of that mountain. And this is the peak of like a diffuse mountain, perhaps. Okay. Uh, same thing that actually association rules are frequent item sets also. Some sort of like a discrete space where all you're trying to find is where is the regions where there's, um, uh, you know, subsets of elements have high frequency of occurrence. Okay, so like uh, frequent items has literally just mean that, okay, there's this collection of items, they occur more often than not in my data set. Okay, uh, so bananas are purchased with apples more often than, uh, you know, let's say toothpaste and apples, okay, something like that. Uh, so just looking at high frequency regions of your uh, data set space or, or the frequency empirical distribution of, the, of your data set. Okay, dimensional reduction, again, everybody is aware of PCA, right? Um, yes or no? No? Oh, you've not done 572 or 575, right? <laughs> You're doing it right now. Yeah. LDA, latent additional allocation? No, latent additional allocation is something else. If you're talking about linear discriminant analysis, that's something else. And PCA is something else. Yeah? Principal common analysis. Yeah. Linear discriminant analysis? No, linear discriminant analysis is like a kind of a analog to logic regression. So LDA and logic regression are kind of similar, uh, where the only difference is that in LDA, 
or linear discriminant analysis, you are making a further assumption on the distribution of the features given the class label as being Gaussian. Okay. That leads to, uh, you know, that's an extra assumption. Without that assumption, it will just be a logic regression problem, uh, a logic regression uh, setting. Okay. So don't get confused with all these acronyms, but uh, we also had an LDA in the, in the, in the text parts that I thought you were talking about that. Um, which is an unsupervised learning technique also. So I didn't want to uh, connect that, but uh, so anyway, just to recall, PCA is just about finding directions of highest variance in a data. Okay, that's because that's the, you think that the variance in the data, the directions of variance in the data are the ones which are informative to discriminate between things. Okay, so for example, if there are a bunch of points in three dimensions, uh, here's a very illustrative example of trying to find a two dimensional plane, like, so reducing the dimension by one, but you can imagine that you're going from 100 dimensions to 110 dimensions, sorry, 100 dimensions to 10 dimensions, uh, where on this plane, if you just flatten the plane and look at it from uh, now, look at it from uh, on the plane itself, you can see that points are kind of spread out. Okay, on this plane, there's the most amount of variations happening. Uh, okay, uh, just think of it that way. Uh, whereas out, out of this plane, so if there's if you think of a perpendicular that is cutting through this plane uh, and go back to the three dimensional space, the points are not moving away from this plane too much. Okay, there's not much variation. Whereas in the plane, points are jumping around quite a bit. Okay, PCA is just trying to find out that subspace. Okay, uh, subspace is just a kind of a smallest part of a vector space. Yeah, the the PC one can be a combination of two dimensions, right? Uh, yeah, know. original dimensions. This is just a change of basis. Uh, so yeah, principal component. So so what we have found here is principal component direction. Sorry, this is uh. No, this this arrow that you see here, uh, this PC one arrow, is the principal component direction, and there's another principal component direction. Uh, those two are new bases, okay. And uh, the principal component value itself, yeah, it could be a, it it is typically a linear combination of the original values in the original bases. Yeah, so you have the, I mean, it's just some sort of a re. Uh, uh, so each principal component for the, for the new point is going to be some linear combination of the uh, coordinates of the features in the original space. If you want to think of it that way, I don't want to confuse people. Uh, here we are just looking at the geometric picture of what exactly is going on. We just want to find a subspace where data is varying the most and ignore the subspace where data is not changing too much. Okay, that's the geometric view. But if you just think of operationally, it's just a transformation, it's just a, a, you know rotating and scaling bunch of points, which is essentially a linear transformation, which means that new points are just going to be some linear combinations of Original points. Okay. It's like taking a paper and trying to fit the 3D points onto the paper. Yes, that's what we're doing here, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, this is the paper here, which is kind of like this. Uh, and so, in that, uh, yeah, in that space, uh, we have now new coordinates. Okay. If you think of the x and y axis here, these point representations here. Uh, whatever the x comma y here is, is related to the x, y, z in the original space, linearly. Okay, that's all I meant. Yeah. But this, I think, needs more treatment. I mean, this is just talking about one picture is, doesn't justify what's going on, but it's nothing complex. Okay, it's just a projection into a lower dimensional space, a linear projection factor. So it's the nicest way, situation. Um, the next one, which you might have heard of and might have done in 570, or, or maybe you will briefly look at it, is uh, more classical uh, statistical way of doing things, which is, I mean, statistics is all about inverting, you know, uh, uh, assuming a distribution function, probability distribution function, and then estimating the parameters of the, such, distribu such a distribution function. And so here's an example, right? You have a bunch of points, you can try to fit a Gaussian. Maybe Gaussian is not a good idea, but you can fit a Gaussian. The fit Gaussian is like uh, the blue curve here in this illustration. Or you have a bunch of these red points in 2D space, and you can fit uh, two Gaussians, okay? Uh, this would be a, a Gaussian, a mix of two Gaussians, right? Um, so this would be called density estimation. Just uh, trying to have, a, you assume that the data belongs to uh, a parametric family, typically, um, or a mixture of parametric family distributions. And then you're just trying to fit the parameters of that, that mixture. Okay, And that fitting is just a maximum accurate estimation problem. By the way, that's very similar to cross, cross entropy loss and all that. They, there is an interpretation of them as maximizing entropy, you know, not maximizing, but maximizing likelihood and so on also. So even logistic regression's objective function, which is actually just cross entropy loss, uh, has also a maximum, has a notion of maximizing likelihood, okay? 
So what I'm trying to say is that this is also an unsupervised learning um, approach because all you're doing is a collection of data points and all you're saying is here's a parametric uh, compression where I just have to remember two parameters which represent the data, okay? Like mean and the variance of a, if you're putting Gaussian. Okay. Uh, so those are all things that you might see in other courses. I will not spend too much time on them. How many of you are kind of uh, new to density estimation? It's just uh, estimating the mean and variance of parametric distributions like Gaussians and gamma distribution or many other distribution, beta distribution and so on. Yeah. So it's just max defining the likelihood and then trying to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood of the data. So you do have some optimization problem there. Uh, and it's own set of, you know, it's a full course. So in other, other departments, you will not talk about it. Um, so next is uh, embedding. Okay. So embedding is this idea which just generalizes the idea of dimensional reduction uh, and something that we've seen before when we talked about image embeddings with pre-trained models or word embeddings with uh, contextual or non-contextual models, right? Uh, here, we're gonna try to get something similar. We're, we're gonna get, we're gonna embed either images or other, other objects into a uh, lower dimensional space. So very similar to, uh, uh, I guess in the previous situations, we were solving a supervised learning task. And as a byproduct of that, those models that were trained can be used to embed, you know, things which are not exactly vectors to vectors, right? So here, uh, the emphasis is more on, if you have lots of images of, let's say, the same cat, maybe you don't need like the million images to represent that cat. Maybe you just need some sort of, you, you want to think of like some compressions like going down to a lower dimensional space. Um, so that's what uh, we mean by embedding here. It's exactly the same idea going to a vector space. Embedding just is like literally a vector, uh, but we'll do that in a way which is like unsupervised in the sense that we don't need to know labels and stuff. Uh, we will just like invert to back. Uh, again, we did not need to know labels, but we created a prediction problem. And then as a result of that, we learned the embedding of words. Here, we're gonna create a prediction problem. Uh, and as a result of that, we'll learn the embeddings of um, some of these objects like images. Okay, that's what we are showing on the right side. You're not expected to know this because I'm gonna talk about it uh, after the break uh, in a couple of minutes, in, in 10 minutes. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of look at this architecture in a few minutes. And finally, uh, sampling. Uh, sampling is, uh, you know, here's just trying to get some uh, Pokemon images, but basically sampling as it says, right? So it's an unsupervised learning task where you want to go from data set to some sort of object, some sort of a um, model or object uh, where you're not talking about distributions, parameter distributions. You don't have to talk about clusters. You don't have to explicitly at least talk about these things. You want to go from data to some object from which you can sample new things. Okay, you can go, you can sample uh, new points, data points. Okay, you could do that even with density estimation. If you go from a bunch of points to a Gaussian distribution, then you can say, okay, random dot random or whatever is the appropriate function call, you can just uh, get new points from that explicit density. Here is the same idea, but directly, you know, skipping over the fact that you don't have to actually explicitly talk about a parameter distribution, you can just focus on sampling okay, as, as a task. Okay, if you, if you care all about, trans, uh, if you only care about sampling, you don't have to explicitly talk about, oh, I want to estimate a density in between. That could be intermediate step, but you don't have to talk about it. Okay, those are some tasks in unsupervised learning. Um, let's take a break and we'll talk, we'll kind of set up uh, uh, the stage for the type of models we'll see next. Okay, uh, what I want to cover is, uh, actually I'm just going to cover autoencoder, not even go to the variation autoencoder. That's the, so about 10, 15 slides. Cause I want to just uh, look at a couple of uh, papers just to give you a sense of um, uh, papers related to the text part, which is the first part of the lecture. I want to just briefly look at a couple of papers, uh, not really any, anything in depth, but just to kind of give you a flavor of what these guys at OpenAI and other places actually write. Um, uh, publicly disclose. So, okay, learning a distribution, right? So unsupervised learning is all about learning some patterns and um, patterns are just functions of the distribution. As I said, like even k-means, you can just think of a view where the clusters are basically the regions where high probability, uh, there's high probability mass. So there is a probability distribution 
So what you're trying to do is basically go from a large amount of data uh, from some distribution. You're just trying to compute, uh, you know, an object like PM. M stands for data model and D stands for data, uh, such that you know one of the properties is a such that samples from PM uh, look similar to the samples from PD. Okay? Because when you're when you're fitting uh, like you're fitting these two Gaussians here. Right in two dimensions, it's not like the data realistically actually came from a couple of Gaussians. It might have come from ten Gaussians. It's just that the eight other Gaussians are like so small and so you know uh, close to these Gaussians that two Gaussians are good enough, right? So, uh, so that real data could be PD, which is this bunch of red dots, which is the actual data, and PM is this uh, two peaks, a mixture of two Gaussians that you're building. You. You don't need to know exactly that PM, you know, after estimating PM has to be exactly the same as whatever the distribution to generate the data, if at all there was a distribution. Uh, but it's just that perhaps the samples should look the same as if, you know, get from the one or the other, they are kind of, you can't distinguish which one you got from, okay? Um, and there are a couple of approaches to do this. Obviously, you know, uh, I'm just trying to kind of put, paint the landscape of learning a distribution here, uh, like a distribution, like a Gaussian distribution and so on. Um, a couple of approaches. One is the explicit approach where you explicitly write down what PM could be. Like you just like a specification of the model and you're just filling in the blanks of like, what are the parameters of the model? Like for example, PM is a mixture of two Gaussians. It's just that you don't know the means and the variances. Okay. So that would be an explicit approach where you're writing down, okay, PM is this to mixture of two Gaussians. I just want to know the mean and variance. Okay? Uh, there's an implicit approach, which is what is a little bit different, which kind of moves away from maximizing likelihood and those types of ideas where you try to go from data set to an object, which we still call PM, but it's an object, which is, you know, where you're trying, where you are not explicitly trying to maximize likelihood, but you still got that object somehow. And we'll look at an example later uh, in the, maybe in the next lecture, it's called a GAN. Uh, and, uh, but the nice thing about that object is you can still sample and it will look like, okay, the samples from this object are look like as if, you know, it was generated from the uh, distribution that generated the data as well. Okay. And, uh, and that would be called an implicit approach where you're not explicitly mentioning, okay, what is the distribution? Is it a mixture of Gaussians or whatnot? We, we don't, we don't explicitly say that. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of words here, but I just wanted to show that uh, maximum likelihood, uh, which is just about maximum likelihood is just a, is a principal way to say, Hey, here's the data. How do I fit this object so that it maximizes the likelihood of the existing data? Okay. Uh, the implicit approach, uh, we're going to look at this, uh, acronym, uh, this modeling approach called GAN, uh, and we'll see some examples next time. They're really good. I mean, GAN is a really good modeling approach, which got just like BERT, you know, has lost the limelight because of transformers. GAN has, GANs have lost the limelight a little bit because of stable diffusion and whatnot, some DALI type of new models. Uh, but we look at this canonical model called GAN next time. And in the explicit approach, uh, we look at this block called variational learn encoder. So in explicit, there's something called approximation of density. We'll look at it, what is meant by approximating a density function. And uh, that approximating the density function leads to this notion of called, uh, uh, in addition to the approximating density, we'll also have some sort of a optimization objective. And that's called, another name people use in the literature is called variational. But anyway, we look at an approach called variational order encoding. So all this to say, forget about all these extra words in this picture. Uh, we're gonna look at, uh, let me go here. We're gonna look at two, models. Okay. We're going to mostly think about forward pass. Okay. Uh, we're going to think of forward pass model definition, but now since it's unsupervised, we'll also try to focus a little bit on the objective function. Okay. Data set is fine. It's either text or images. Mostly we'll look at images in this case. Okay. Data set part is fine. Uh, training optimization part is it's going to be back propagation. So that part is also kind of familiar. Uh, what's going to be, uh, brought back into the lean light or kind of in focus is not just the model architecture in the forward pass, but also the objective function because objective function uh, is going to be different from cross entropy loss or something that you've been kind of using pretty much throughout the previous six lectures or seven lectures. Okay. Um, so in the explicit, explicit case, variation order encoders, in the implicit case, generative adversarial networks. These are mouthful in terms of the words for defining, you know, stating these models, but we'll look at them uh, next time. Okay. Um, 
this time we'll look at a simpler model called auto encoder and then switch topics to something else. Yeah. So okay. So why why did a bucket, you know, you know, at least uh, informally classify building these objects from which you can sample or uh, uh, as both uh, as as both explicit or implicit is because many times you don't explicitly need the distribution function itself. Okay. For example, if you just care about sample samples, which is what we were talking about, then uh, you're okay with any object as long as it creates uh, data points which looks the same as the original data points. You know, you don't want to get the same data points as the training data or whatever the input data, but you want to create new data points uh, which look similar uh, to the uh, um, corpus data the data points that you already have. Okay, uh, when can that be useful? Maybe, for example, when you're just planning. Okay, there sometimes there are what I call planning or decision making settings where you don't need the density function or anything. You just want to know oh, what are scenarios that can happen in the future. Okay, uh, this figure probably doesn't justify it. Just think of it as a in a situation where you are. Um, uh, like a self-driving car, then you just want to know what all scenarios can happen in the future. Maybe pedestrian can come from there, maybe a new car come from the left side and whatnot. So those would be scenarios. You don't need to have an explicit density function to plan what to do next. Maybe if you know what are the some likely uh, future um, situations that can happen, uh, then you can just plan. Okay. So all I'm saying is there could be situations where you can just get samples of what can happen in the future and just move on. Okay. Just, uh, just do planning based on that. Okay, so you don't need a density function. Uh, other situations are where you don't need a density function, uh, where samples themselves are useful. Like for example, here's an original image and there's a task called super resolution. Maybe you've heard about it. If you've not heard about it, it's about going from low resolution images to high resolution images. Um, so at training time, there's a model that's learned which knows how to go from low resolution to high resolution. And then at, uh, uh, at, uh, at inference time, you can go from any image to a high resolution image. Uh, so this is another example where, again, you are not explicitly modeling what is the all the what is the distribution of all images that can happen given the input image, um, but you just want to get a sense of what are the what are some likely uh, output images that can happen. Okay, uh, I don't. Yeah, so just to give a sense, like this left side image is the original image. Uh, I have not shown you the input low resolution image, but the rightmost image has the suffix at least called GAN. SR means super resolution, uh, but rightmost uh, uh, image has this uh, acronym GAN, and that's the model that we'll look at next time. Uh, but the underlying idea is to go from a low resolution image, which is not being shown here, to a high resolution image. You don't have to explicitly model the probability density function of how to go from low, res low resolution to high resolution. Um, so that's what, uh, uh, so in, in these situations, you, it's okay to have an implicit approach, some object, which is not a density function and you can just, um, move on. Um, another example is, you know, creative situations where you're just trying to say, okay, draw something and you can generate new outputs. That's very clear that you don't need to have a explicit, explicit distribution function, um, uh, characterization of, uh, characterization given, given your input data. Okay, so uh, right hand pictures are just going from a, uh, a, a drawing like this to a bunch of images. Uh, or you can go from satellite view to uh, you know some other views or go from segmented images to segmented inputs to like an actual fill in the blanks. Like here's a segment of a car, just fill in the car. It could be a, uh, you know, it could be a Toyota, it could be uh, you know a Tesla, you know. Um, so for these types of operations, now it's already in such a rich space that you don't think in terms of Gaussians and so on. Uh, you don't think of explicit density, you don't think of explicit distribution construction. It's not needed. You can always build an explicit distribution um, or an explicit PM, uh, but it's not necessary. Um, and actually, as you see, uh, when we look at generated serial networks, it'll become more clear of what the application is of these types of um, models. Okay. Uh, any questions about uh, what I just said? Or is it too, I mean, it was just very high level, just showing show, show that, uh, you know, there are multiple approaches to get to this object from which you can sample. And we are really talking about images. And so you can really imagine how complex the object should be, but we just want to sample images, which look like this data set of images that we have, corpus of un, unlabeled images that we have, uh, and uh, whether it be 
do an ex explicit approach where we talk about a distribution function, or we do an implicit approach where we talk about an object. It's not a distribution function, but we still can get a sample from it. Um, that's what we wanted to. That's a, that's what I wanted to kind of uh, point out. Okay. Multiple routes to get to the same sampling object, uh, an object from which we can sample. Okay, so either model, uh, basically we don't want to just memorize also. So it's not like when we say sample, just pick one of the items in your thing, you know, in your corpus of uh, data points or images and just use that as a output. Okay, that's not what we're trying to do. We are actually trying to synthesize a new data point. Okay, so uh, either of the models that we'll see later, uh, okay, VAE or GAN, uh, will essentially kind of you know, when we train those models somehow, uh, we'll essentially get some box like this, this yellow box. And it'll have it's, it is gonna be a neural network box because we are in the deep learning course and it'll have some parameters. Uh, and the way these things will generate new data, new samples, it'll, they need to have a source of randomness. Okay, uh, some source of randomness. Uh, so let's say we have a Gaussian distribution from which we can get a sample and it's passed through this yellow box. And from that yellow box, we get a point, okay? We get points like, uh, I mean, I'm not showing the points, but we get uh, a distribution over uh, things that we care about. Like X, let's say X is the image space, then we get a distribution over the image space, okay? This, this yellow box is basically going from this distribution, which is, let's say, unique Gaussian distribution, to a distribution in the image space, which we are we really hard to kind of, practically look at what is the distribution in image space because even if you think of CIFAR 10 data, 32 cross 32 cross three is a, such a large dimensional space. Like how do you even visualize what is the distribution in that space? But if you could just uh, cartoonish way, think of it as two dimensional space, there's some distribution over that image space. Okay, that's what this yellow box is doing. Going from a structured dis, you know space, uh, like a unit Gaussian space to a distribution over images. And the hope is that that distribution over images is such that it's close to the true data distribution. Okay, so some sort of closeness between uh, data distribution generated by this model and the true data distribution. If it, if they're far, then obviously during training, you're gonna keep changing the theta so that they're kind of close. Okay, so that's what we wanna do. Uh, but the complexity here is that we are working with uh, very high dimensional spaces. Image space, image is a tensor, right? So 30 cross 30 cross three in this, you know, this smallest case, but you could have megapixel size images. And it's really, really large states, you know, large space, uh, and, th and that's the challenge. So how to create, you know, get a good handle on the distribution, which approximates the true distribution. And therefore, when we sample a new point uh, from this green thing, uh, hopefully we get a realistic looking image. Okay, and that's what uh, this text to image models do. But the text part is like some sort of conditioning that we do. And in my previous examples that I showed. Uh, there was also conditioning, and that's why maybe the examples did not make too much sense. Um, like like uh, like here, uh, this is a conditioning. Condition on this uh, in hand drawn baggage uh, bag generates some new samples. Obviously, we're going to generate new samples, but the condition on that uh, initial image of a bag. Okay, uh, and so text to image, uh, DALI and stable diffusion, they're all the same thing, uh, where you condition on an input string, but you start generating things which are not in the training. Okay, that's the most important part. Um, any questions here? Okay, all we, all we are doing, uh, and we'll do a uh, we'll do some um, modeling next time for both VAE and GANs next time. But today, for the next ten minutes or so, we'll look at just autoencoders, which are the precursor to uh, VAEs. Okay. Okay. So we'll start with just this cell and get an appreciation appreciation for autoencoder and related to some models that you've seen before. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll do the VA and GANs next time. Uh, but in between, after, uh, towards the end of the lecture, I want to quickly show some research papers um, related to GPTs actually. So that's the project plan for the next 20 minutes. Um, autoencoders are not too complex. So let's see how much we can cover. So all these terms hopefully are new to all of you. So how many of you have heard of autoencoders before? You've heard about it. Uh, you've not played around or uh, trained or anything. Okay. 
So we'll get to variation on encoders, which has extra prefix variation later, which is next time. But we'll just kind of disambiguate what is an autoencode. Okay. Uh, it turns out, it's, although it's a fancy word, it actually has close connections to your PCA. So we'll make that connection today. Okay. We'll make that connection uh, when we talk about autoencoders. So um, for that, we just want to recap about neural networks. Okay. One important property that's going to be important for many of these generation technologies that you see. So all these open AI, um, DALI or stable diffusion or uh, GANs and all these models that you'll see, which can generate things, especially images, you need to know obviously the CNNs, uh, con layer, but also another layer, which we're gonna, which we're gonna call as the transpose con, con layer, okay? Um, so, here is a picture of the opposite op operation. This is going to be essential for anything of this nature where you have to generate an image, okay? When you're generating a class label, you know that you can always go down and you get a vector and you get a distribution of uh, class labels or distribution of words and whatnot. Here, we want to generate an image, okay? So what does the process look like? Uh, you can think of, uh, so this is an example of a, what is called a deconvolutional, uh, which is actually technically incorrect and that's why it's crossed out, or what is called a transposed convolutional network, okay? What is it doing? Its input is a vector and output is an image, okay? You may say, okay, a vector, if it's only 10 numbers, how am I going from 10 numbers to 32 cross 32 cross three? Is because uh, neural network weights have some patterns, uh, you know, some bunch of, you know, inbuilt patterns about images so that you can actually generate an image, okay? So what are we doing? Going from a vector to a tensor to a potentially a bigger tensor, bigger tensor, bigger tensor, and then a really big, you know, big in terms of width and height, and uh, you know the depth has been reduced. Okay, so that's what you can see, right? So you can see that the tensor depth has reduced, is kind of reducing, and here it's just a depth of three, so you can actually really visualize this image. Okay, so how do you go from tensor to tensor where tensor width and height is increasing and the depth is decreasing? It's exactly the same idea as the way we did it in con, con layer. Okay, we're still gonna do a some sort of a starting operation with filters. Okay, we're gonna stride. Uh, we're gonna kind of stride around, and we're gonna generate new numbers. Okay, it's just gonna be width and height is gonna be more, and depth we'll try to reduce by just choosing the number of filters. Okay. So this is a new new gadget, and we're gonna kind of use them, and not just us in this canonical models that we'll see today and next lecture, but all the new modern uh, models like, um, as I said, stable diffusion and stuff. Uh, they all use the same thing. Are almost the same thing. So uh, why does this make sense, right? So here's a same picture from the previous slide. Um, and, and I want to just motivate why we can get from, uh, for example, four numbers to uh, 16 numbers. Okay, So here's a picture on the left side where I have four numbers at the top. Okay, it's like, think of it as, uh, this way, right? So let's say you had four numbers and you're going to go from four numbers to 16 numbers, which is the bottom. Okay, four cross, so you're going from two cross two matrix to a four cross four matrix, okay? Uh, it's, I, all I want to do with this slide is just to, in case you're confused of how I'm going from four numbers to 16 numbers, I just wanted to kind of really drive home the point that it's nothing complicated. It's a very simple uh, view, which is just going from, you're just saying going from, I'm going to go from a four dimensional vector to a 16 dimensional vector, okay? If you're going to look at it this way, you know, it's a matrix, but you can always vectorize it, right? So I just want to vectorize it. So if you look at it this way, it doesn't seem that unnatural. You're actually looking at a four dimensional vector. I want to create a 16, 16 dimensional vector. How do I do that? I just need a matrix which has 16 rows and four columns. Okay. And uh, in fact, you can just use a, um, yeah, in fact, you can use a uh, filter whose weights uh, kind of uh, are kind of reused here. You can see that W00 is used uh, four times. Um, W11 is used a few times, four times, and so on. So if you if you place uh, filter weights this way, okay, then you can you you can ensure that you can get sixteen numbers out of four numbers, okay, without um, yeah without using too many numbers. I mean here is it's just a filter which has a W00, W01, W02. Uh, it's, it's basically a three cross three filter, actually. Let me just uh, say that. So if you if you just kind of sum up, um, look at the number of unique entries in this matrix, they're only exactly the same as a three cross three filter, but the way it's designed is such that you can go from 
one number to sorry four numbers to 16 numbers so what exactly is happening is that each of the numbers in this four numbers is contributing to nine numbers nine numbers okay so there's this this number here dark, dark one is contributing to these nine numbers this other number is going to contribute to these nine numbers this number um this um is going to contribute to these nine numbers and so on okay so it's it's nothing uh new that is happening i hope that didn't confuse you too much all i'm saying is it's a linear transformation going from a smaller smaller tensor in terms of height and width to a bigger tensor with in terms of height and width okay is, is that fine okay this gadget i mean we'll not get into this level of depth but all i'm saying is this is a gadget that we kind of can reuse again and again once we know that we can go from vectors to images as long as we train it and the training process since it's a linear map everywhere is a linear map and some sort of non-linearities we can always uh, backdrop exactly the way we were doing with the con part okay with that out of the picture, you know, clear. So now let's talk about, um, we just looked at uh, going from vector to an image. Uh, let's say we had a specific vector and a specific image. Okay. Let's say ve vector of all ones and a specific image, which is an image of a cat. Okay. And now we have this transpose common network and we just have to learn the parameters such that we can go from this vector to this image. Okay. That, you know, that problem doesn't seem too hard because I, I know for this input, for, for this uh, input, it's, it needs to be, I need to change the weights such that from this input, I keep changing the weights such that I get this image. Okay. First of all, this, if it's a vector of all ones, it has nothing, no information about the cat. Okay. So all the information, so all patterns about the cat somehow has to be captured in the weights of those filters. Okay. Uh, on the filter parameters and whatnot, so that you can re generate an image of a cat. So in the sense that, the information about these features should be captured in the weights. Okay. That's uh, that should be clear because the input is not informative about that. And how do you train it? You just train by minimizing the error between, uh, you know, at any given point of time, there's going to be a bunch of parameters. It's going to produce some pattern. And if the pattern doesn't look like a cat, you just kind of reduce, you know, change the weight such that it looks, start looking like cat. So mean square error between this target image and the image that is currently generated by the current parameters. Okay. So that's the natural thing to do. So, so, so that makes sense for a single, you know, some vector and an image. Now start thinking about, okay, what if I have another vector and another image? Okay. Now I want to have, ensure that this vector of one still produces an image of a cat. The other vector produces an image of something else, maybe a dog. Another vector produces an image of a, uh, you know, like a fox. Okay. Then what, then what you're trying to do is, uh, maybe there's some difference between the vectors, but there has to be common patterns among these, for example, animals that has to be, you know, that has to be captured among uh, these weights of this neural network. Okay, so this neural network is, will need to start capturing some common patterns among these uh, collection of images. Okay, so that's one property I wanted to mention. And on top of that, what if I don't even have these vectors? Okay, what I can do is. I can say, uh, I have the target image. That's, you know, I just don't have the vectors that I prefer. Uh, like all ones, I don't care about all ones. So what I can do is take the uh, target, the image that I have, pass it through an encoder network, which is just going to be a con network, uh, convolutional neural network. It's going to think of an AlexNet or whatever that you used, ResNet 18 without the last layer. And uh, it's going to produce a vector. Whatever vector it is, I, I don't, you know, particularly care. But once I have that vector, again, I want to, apply the decom network so that I can re reproduce back an image that is as close to the input image as possible. Okay. So that's what, uh, you know, uh, I want to do, and I don't want to do just for one image, uh, but for multiple images. Okay. In that case, both the encoder and decoder now have to start, you know, finding common patterns in the like a thousand images or 10,000 images so that every image hopefully can get a decent reconstruction. Okay. That's what we're doing. So we have, we started with an image, Come, you know, transform it down to some vector, which we're not, you know, particularly specifying which vector it is, but it's some vector. And we're going to call it a latent vector because it's not part of the data. Something that we're just, uh, you know, creating as part of our model definition. Uh, it's not part of the data. That's why we're calling it latent. And uh, and then we're just focusing on the reconstruction uh, performance. Okay. Uh, these vectors are also called codes. And this part is called the decoder, and this part is called the encoder. And this process is called auto encoding. Okay. Um, 
this process is called auto encoding. So what I, what exactly are we doing? We are auto just means self. Uh, so we're just encoding the Im images uh, by comparing it with uh, comparing with comparing the input with itself, uh, or comparing the input with a reconstructed version of itself. Okay. So we are encoding the input by comparing the input with uh, with uh, a reconstructed version of itself, and that's why it's called an auto encoder. Why are we doing this? Uh, at least in auto encoder, the objective is to compress. Okay. So by if if we have a a million images of different types of cats. By you know learning these encoder and decoder weights uh, or parameters, we're trying to ensure that these weights capture some common patterns among all these different cats so that I'm able to reconstruct each one of them as best as possible. I may not be able to 100% reconstruct every one of them, but uh, somehow the encoder and decoder are capturing some common patterns. Uh, and and uh, basically what I'm achieving is dimensional, dimensionality reduction. Right, I'm going from these images, which are 32 cross 32 cross three, or maybe a thousand cross thousand cross three, to a vector space, maybe 100 100 dimensional vector or 300 dimensional vector. Uh, and by doing this auto encoding process and training, I'm able to compress this vector, these images down to uh, 100 dimensional space uh, without any supervisory labels. Okay, uh, which is very different from what we were doing with uh, uh, just CNNs and getting image embeddings from pre-trained CNNs. Like a pre-trained ResNet based, uh, pre-trained ImageNet based model, there was labeled data. Some humans actually spent a ton of time annotating those data. Then you got the train the CNN. Once you train the CNN, you can always get embeddings. Here, we just have a bunch of images. It doesn't matter if it's ImageNet or something else. We have a bunch of images. Somehow, because of this uh, auto encoding process, we are able to embed, uh, bring those and bring down these images to lower dimensional space while this encoder and decoder capture the patterns of the data. Okay, it's nothing. You know, amazingly new. You can always like vectorize your image and just to PCA if you want to see what which directions are like the most uh, have the most variance. Uh, so this is actually an, a kind of a uh, belongs to the same kind of I guess idea of like doing this compression or projection down to lower dimensions. Okay. So what are we trying to do? I, I, at least the high level is just we're trying to capture the information in training data. So whatever information is there, whatever common information is there across these images. Uh, we want to capture them, okay? Um, and and each of the Z's that we get from from each of the training data images, you can call them as the embedding of that image. So this embedding is very different. I mean, it's the same idea. I mean, it's, you got an embedding of an image, but with, you got an embedding embedding from an image without relying on any labeled data, okay? Without relying on labels, which is uh, pretty cool, right? So you don't spend any effort on uh, annotation. Um, generally, the dimension of Z this uh, the smaller dimensional space typically, uh, sorry, this this vector space is going to be smaller than the input x. Okay, so uh, think of it as like ten dimension, hundred dimension, whereas the input is going to be thirty cross thirty cross three is definitely not hundred. It's bigger than hundred, right? Uh, so there's some compression, and there is a slight variation of a model called a denoising order encoder where uh, z dimension can be bigger than uh, input dimension, uh, but that's a different, slightly different model, uh, similar similar idea, uh, but Let's not focus on that. Now, this order encoder structure is not specific to images. Okay, although we have been talking in terms of images and embedding images and learning common patterns across images, it's it's a general architecture. Instead of if you had encoder and decoder, which is just feed forward neural networks, uh, that would still work. I mean, as long as your input and outputs are just vectors, for example, it's the same thing. Okay. Um, so just to uh, kind of uh, summarize this part, no labels are needed. And you're going, so you have a bunch of data points like this, and each data point, you're just going through transformations and in kind of inverse transformation. You're learning these parameters so as to minimize this some sort of a squared loss, okay? And uh, yeah, and uh, what are its users? Users are basically, um, Wherever you're using PCA, PCA is a linear projection, linear uh, reduction operation. Okay. Uh, instead, uh, auto encoders uh, embedding, like if you look, if you pick up only the encoder part, uh, that's going to be giving you a nonlinear uh, reduction, nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, if you pick the encoder encoder to be just a no hidden layer neural network, so it's just a P-power network with no hidden layer. 
Okay, and the decoder also to be a no hidden layer neural network, as in just the one, you know, W comma B at the decoder side, and W comma B at the encoder side. Then this actually, uh, this problem, uh, this loss minimization problem is exactly, uh, not exactly, but uh, yeah, exactly the same as the uh, PCA problem. Okay, so PCA's problem is to go down in lower dimension. Uh, such that it has some property in terms of uh, going back when you reconstruct it's the best uh, linear uh, i guess uh, projection technique okay it, it minimizes the mean square error in some sense i'm not going to talk you know get into the technical sense there uh, so an order encoder is going to be exactly the same as the pca actually not exactly the same very similar in terms of pca if you use a no hidden layer encoder or no hidden layer decoder except in pca there is this strict constraint on the principal component directions being orthogonal. Whereas if you just do this with the uh, no hidden layer encoder, no hidden layer decoder, you still are basically doing a linear transformation, except that the uh, uh, you're not kind of, uh, you, you won't get orthogonality in terms of, um, um, there's no orthogonality between, uh, between, I guess, principal directions. There's no principal directions explicitly, okay? So it's still a linear projection you get. In fact, since you're not imposing orthogonality constraint, you might actually get a better fit. So think of PCA as like uh, doing auto encoding, except you have a constraint on the, constraint on the uh, principal component directions in the lower dimension space or the Z space. Okay. Yeah. So uses uh, it's basically all about compression. Uh, we'll see. I mean, wherever you're using dimensional reduction of your data set, you can also do the same thing here, and, and then process that data for future like you know prediction or some downstream task. Okay. So that's auto encoder. Uh, so I hope, uh, you know, just summarize, it's basically a way to compress data and, uh, without labels and you can get embeddings of objects that so far we saw that you need embeddings by, by training on some auxiliary task or some sort of, uh, labeled data, at least for images. Any questions, uh, for this part? You can go back on one more slide. Something I have, uh, seen it was written like denoising. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, is it like there are different denoising um, techniques or? No, no. So, this denoising order encoder, so denoising, by the way, means many things in many different contexts. What I uh, like in the context of what I'm saying is a. So, think of it. So, without even thinking about order encoders, right? Let's say there was an image which is which has noise in it, like uh, because of the sensor or something, it got, uh, it has aberrations. Uh, there are models which can remove that those vibrations. Those are, you know, you can denoise denoise an input signal or input data. <clears throat> okay, so that's just denoising. That's just a problem of denoising. Uh, this denoising order encoder is a different idea where they are saying, uh, I want to reconstruct this input image, but I'm not going to give you the input image itself. I'm going to add noise, and then I want you to create recreate the input image. Why? Because of certain properties, you know. Uh, by doing so, what they can do ensure is that Z can be a bigger dimension and they're, do, they're, they're aiming, aiming for not compression, but for something else, okay? Uh, it's still a transformation, but they are explicitly adding noise and then you want to reconstruct something, uh, reconstruct the original image, okay? That way the model will still learn how to get rid of the noise while trying to reconstruct. Okay? Now, denoising by, you know, it's nothing uh, technically deep. It just means removing noise, right? Um, okay, uh, so, yeah. About this encoder and decoder, uh, our decoder can just simply be an inverse of our encoder. Uh, That's why we, we were talking about inverse, right? What does inverse of a encoder mean, right? So, how do you invert like a con layer? You can't just arbitrarily invert a con layer. There's actually a decon layer that you need to use, or sorry, a transpose con layer that you need to use. Yeah, but we are inverting. In the vector case, like if you just have a vector feed power network and then a feed power network, it's clear like what is the decoder. It's just a W comma B with the 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 weights, let's say the matrix dimensions being suitably so that you can actually get back to the same dimension as the input. Right? So we can have sort of inverse parameters for both. Currently, the parameters of these two step, these two things are not tied together. Mm -hmm. These two are just uh, yeah unrelated parameters currently. But could we do it? Uh... Like, would they be linked to each other unless uh, the encoder results in some sort of information loss? That way, decoder. Uh, even I mean, you're you're thinking of uh, a function, a function inverse, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but 
yeah i mean you can think about it but it's not currently really linked so uh information loss uh, there is going to be information loss in these types of anytime you project down you know you're going to have information loss so yeah i mean yeah i don't know exactly where you're going but basically currently these two are not um we don't have it's not like if i have weights for one i can just say one by weights or something else and i can get the decoder yeah if you are going if you're thinking of that that way it's not like matrix and matrix inverse it's not like that i mean at least for auto encoders it's not like that okay we are kind of towards the end so i did want to see show something uh but i'll just mention the papers and we can probably look at it Actually, we can look at it sometime later when we actually talk about GPT. Um, so this one, I tried to open Hugging Face. It's not, did they fix the issue? Yes, they did. Okay, so I guess then we can just look at, so there is, uh, you can just go to BERT, BERT model, uh, which is in the, in the repository, uh, right? So you can just go to BERT based on case and you can just see um, like, you know, here's the inference API. You can just compute and see what it says. Um, this is a distribution. So this is how the BERT model is based on encoders, right? So uh, looks like so you have a mask for a sentence, and then you can just fill in what is the distribution. You get a distribution over the words of what word can fill in the blank over there, right? So you can read up about BERT uh, models from this page, uh, which is this. By the way, this is linked on the our lecture goals uh, for this section. Okay, so you can just go there. Um, well, not just this model, this will be very useful for you guys for your project. So that's what I wanted to do, just show that this is a good uh, source. Uh, you can also obviously go to BERT's uh, Wikipedia page. Uh, it has a very interesting set of information on what is the pre-training, you know, what is, how is it language modeling? Uh, how is it doing next sentence prediction? Things like that. We, we briefly discussed this at the beginning of the lecture, but you can just read about it. Um, the second thing I wanted to quickly mention, and we're not going to get into the details of the papers, are uh, these papers um, by OpenAI folks uh, related to GPT. It's, this is actually, this paper uh, is the paper related to OpenAI transformer that we talked about, where we, we have this decoder and we are trying to just predict the next token, right? Um, so all this information we're gonna skip over. Here they actually talk about what is their, you know, what is language model? This is exactly what you did in assignment three, but this is a paper from just four years ago, uh, or five years ago, which is talking about this. How, what is the likelihood of my data? Is the probability of the next word given all the previous words, okay? And here they're just showing you how to do that by just doing the positional encoding, uh, getting the embedding, and then applying a transformer block, and then getting a distribution of words, okay? Um, and then they talk about some things like supervised tuning and so on. Um, and this is a picture that we saw exactly from our slide. This is this is from their paper of how to do classification. Once you train this open AI transformer, they said, okay, you know, the objective of this paper is really exactly in that P, in that era, it's not even that old, but in that era, we're trying to go from static embeddings to contextual embeddings. And transform open AI transformer was one of these early papers. Uh, just before BERT, which is trying to say that, okay, this autoregressive process can actually create these pre-trained models that can be used for any of these downstream tasks, okay? Like classification, entailment, and all that. Now, this paper led to another model called GPT-2. Okay, so there is a GPT-2, like GPT-4, <laughs> uh, which is actually much smaller. It's actually uh, um, 1.5 billion at the biggest. Uh, actually, the smallest one is like 100, mil 100 or 200 million parameters. So really small. And uh, um, and if you go to their approach, it's still predicting the same thing, next word given the previous words. And uh, if you, they talk about a lot of interesting things. I would suggest uh, trying to find this paper. It's on OpenAI's website. Um, yeah, model, right? Let's not focus on the rest of the paper. It's saying, we use a transform model based architecture for our language models. The model largely follows this open AI transform model. This, this paper is what I just showed you. Um, so they're just saying we didn't change much. It's the transformer thing with the decoder units and which was already discussed in this previous. Okay, that's GPT-2. Now GPT-3, which is a really nice title. Actually GPT-2 also has a nice title. 
sorry. Uh, it's called Language Models are Unsupervised Multitask Learners. Okay, that's the title for this GPT-2. And GPT-3's title is Language Models are Few Short Learners. Okay. Um, this came about in 2020, actually, four years ago, GPT-3. Um, specifically, I mean, this is the name GPT-3, uh, which is a 175 billion parameter model. Okay. Uh, and you can read about, you know, at least whatever publicly disclosed information they have here. Um, and if you look at, the, they have a really long paper, 60 plus pages. And if you look at model, page eight, we use the same model architecture as GPT-2. Okay, I mean, they don't even go about like describing the model again, because, you know, there's no need. And if there's so many other bells and whistles that need to come together so that you can actually achieve this uh, really good performance that they were seeing. And, you know, a year or two later, they had 3.5, and then they made a ChatGPT version of it in November 2022. And... Or was it 2022 or 2020? Okay, now I'm forgetting. But uh, and now you have uh, GPT-4 and, and whatnot. Okay, so it's uh, it's it's nice to see. Uh, at least have a look at these papers now that you know. Um, um, yeah, now that you know the context of some of these previous generation models, that way you can. Um, so here you can see BERT is being talked about, and then they have a the really huge model that, we, that they're proposing here uh, four years ago. Uh, okay, I think I went over three minutes, but uh, uh, any questions about these three papers? Um, you can just search for them uh, and you can get the papers. And I also add the link to uh, link um, in the lecture post.